Hi, guys. Welcome to After Draft, the podcast where Rachel goes on and on about her writing. So I am even less prepared for this episode than I was for the last, which is funny because I had to make that one within like 30 minutes. So, uh, you know, my organization skills have been plummeting. I have decided to focus a little bit more on this podcast and kind of audio only content right now because my verbal communication skills have started to cease. The autism is autisming and um, I'm, I'm feeling it with the video content. So I don't think I'm going to be making any of those anytime soon. But uh, if you're new to this podcast and you're like, what are you talking about videos? Who are you? Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm your host. I am a writer and I run a YouTube channel, which some of you might be listening to this on YouTube. Hello. Some of you might be listening to it on Spotify or other places if I eventually get to uploading it there. But um, this is my podcast where I talk about my writing because sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of the times actually I write really good stuff. And so I want to talk about, you know, how I went about doing that, demystify the writing process. How does a writer create? Why did a writer choose a certain word in that sentence? Why that technique? What are you going for? Kind of just being as self-indulgent as possible. So this episode, we're going to focus on an excerpt that I'm just going to entitle Harry's Son, which, you know, I wasn't thinking I was going to do another body back analysis, um, Body Back is the adult literary fiction novella that I have been writing since very late February. And I had done the first episode analyzing a really great line from Body Back. So make sure you check out the first episode if you haven't already. Um, I do have a video on my YouTube channel sort of explaining this project. So I'm not going to go too in depth in this podcast episode because I feel like that would be boring. Because I feel like the people who are listening to this are the people who already know <laughs> A lot of stuff about my writing. So, you know, hello, the Keeners. I literally had barely any sleep last night. I went to bed at four o'clock in the morning because I was writing Body Back, which like I said, it's a novella. It has been taking all of my energy. It's almost at 16,000 words in the draft. I, I don't think it's going to be much longer than 20,000, if anything. 20,000 was the projected word count goal. So we're almost done. I am three chapters in. I just wrote the best chapter of my life called 24 Karat Harrison. We're not going to talk about that in this episode. But yeah, I did not sleep last night. So for some reason, I was like, I didn't sleep because I woke up at nine, let me drink some Chardonnay in the middle of the afternoon and that'll definitely wake me up. <laughs> I don't drink, actually, funnily, I have another, the reason I'm bringing this up, if, if you are not of legal drinking age, please don't listen to this more. oh my god, I don't wanna be a fan of influence, okay. Um, I don't drink, I'm not a drinker, nothing to do with anything except for the fact that I don't like the taste of alcohol. But um, I have literally, I'm drinking two tablespoons of Chardonnay and I'm like, I'm gonna, now guys um so i have my chardonnay i have a cup of tea also in a mug so you know two drinks neurodivergence anyway let's get into this actual episode because i've been talking for a bajillion years so basically i wanted to talk about revision and how revision can sometimes be not as definitive as you think it is <laughs> and how you can like many different parts of your draft we always hear first drafts suck, you know, like first drafts are supposed to suck. And for some people, that advice is very reassuring. Um, depends on your process, right? For me, I've, I'm really quite a like a clean first drafter. A lot of the writing I share on my YouTube channel, a lot of the writing I get published is, is near first drafts because just of the way like my process works. It's not that, you know, I'm perfect on the first go. It, there's a lot that kind of goes into creating that draft. But I wanted to talk about how you can kind of like elements from a first draft that you then revised later that you miss out on, right? And kind of talk about the nuances of the revision process because I feel like, you know, even even me, myself, like we kind of view, right? Maybe it's just me, I don't know. I view revision almost in the sense as, okay, well, that should hopefully make it better. And there have been cases where revision has made, you know, some certain writing worse and we can talk about that later. But I think the overall ideology about revision in the writing community is okay when you revise your work it's going to get better and I want to talk about like the nuances in that because it's not that it's going to get worse it's just to show that you can appreciate different parts of your drafts like I can still love the first draft of this excerpt that I'm going to share just as much as I love the final draft right all right so let's get into the context like I said we're talking about body back sexy back Justin Timberlake body back 
Rachel Lynch was like, oh, geez. Okay, um, not inspired, in case Justin Timberlake is listening to this. The most relevance I have to Justin Timberlake, by the way, in my life, maybe this is going to make me sound like really Gen Z. So sorry to anyone older than me listening to this. But, like, Justin Timberlake will always be RT, like Arthur from Shrek 3. Like, <laughs> I'm going to move on. And here is the logline for Body Back. It's 2005 in Las Vegas, and 21-year-old Harrison is tired of routines of gods of men on a mission to move past a complicated breakup. He's about to get recklessly indulgent, and he's come to the right place. So yeah, um, this is the chaos novella. I'm honestly getting sick and tired of this, man. I'm like, dude, you are so annoying. Like, I get what it's like to be 21. Like, I'm 21 too, and like, I'm way more boring than he is. But like, sometimes it's just like, you need to calm down and take off the damn fur coat, man. Okay. So the context for the excerpt I'm going to share is, wow, there's a lot. Um, this basically jumps quite nicely off of the last one, which if only I actually can't even remember. What did I even? Oh, I, okay. So I shared in my first episode, the first episode was talking about an excerpt that came after this this section so basically this the context is the same harrison has been breaking into rich people pools and in this chapter his mother Susanna, comes to pick him up because the people catch him the people who own the house instead of calling the police they call his mom because they're like mm, you're a pathetic little child anyway and they feel bad for him not they the the the, the wife I, I talked about this last episode but um anyways so this is the bathroom scene with Susanna and harrison where Susanna is trying to confront her son kind of gently. So I'm going to share the first draft first, and then I'm going to share the final draft. But what's interesting about this excerpt is we're going to focus on a line basically that's centered around Harry's son. I'm nobody's son. We'll, we'll talk about that anyway, because it kind of changes. The, the whole point is it's different in the first draft versus the final draft. And um, yeah, let me just read it, and then I can kind of give context as I go. So this is the first draft. <laughs> You cannot come and go as you please in other people's houses. Susanna can't even look at him. He could call her out by name again. Susanna, Susanna, Susanna. She winces every time he does, plays it off as a sudden headache or a flighty twitch. Isn't that what I do at your place? He says instead, his throat heady with the need to scream or perhaps cry. Parade around as your son and then crash on the couch. Harrison. What? He asks. Where the hell is God in this dim bathroom? Sucked up in the fan, hiding in shower drain hairballs. And where is his father? Both perpetually missing like a television remote, a set of house keys. That's right. God's not here. Not in the wall paint. Not in the patterned hand towels. Not in the piranha portrait above the toilet tank. Not against Harrison's chest like he used to be. He's the only one here in front of his mother, all seven of Mary's sorrows etched into a man. And my name is kind of ironic, isn't it, Harry's son? He almost laughs, but I'm nobody's son. You're my son. Without reading that, that might be like, what the fuck is going on? There's no dialogue tags. Whoops. Anyway, first draft. This is the final draft, which I don't know, final in quotes, because I'm still working on this. <laughs> but this one, there's a shitload of edits, which I will talk about in just a second if I remember. Neurodivergent means gonna forget, and then I'm gonna remember at the end of the episode. All right. Um, okay, second draft. Or not second draft. This is the final draft. This is like the bajillionth draft, to be honest. Isn't that what I do at your place? He says instead, his throat heady with the need to scream or perhaps cry. Parade around as your son and then crash on the couch. Harrison, Sue says. Her eyes are pellets of amber, her pupils preserved in their warmth. As a child, Harrison climbed onto the bathroom counter, pried his own eyes open between his chewed fingernails. The color was wrong, too light, too cold, too much like his father's. And what was a father? God is as much a father as he is a traitor to his own sacrificial son. Harrison stood there for so long his eyes stung, and when his lid eventually snapped back in place, the world stippled. What, he asks now. The fifth commandment says to honor thy father and thy mother, but where the hell is God to condemn him? Caught in the bathroom's dim light bulbs? Sucked up in the fan? Hiding in the shower drain hairballs? And where is his father? Both perpetually missing, like a television remote a set of house keys. That's right. His dad's not here and God's not either. Not in the starfish rug. Not in the patterned hand towels. Not in the piranha portrait above the toilet tank. Not against Harrison's chest like he used to be. He's the only one here in front of his mother. A son, yeah, but whose? 
In elementary school, he learned the meaning of his name for a history project, Harry's son. It all seems so ironic now. He's nobody's son. Ooh, okay, I'm very excited. I'm very excited to talk about this. Okay, so the context behind this excerpt is, this was a pain to write, to be honest. Like, it, it's not a pain in that, like, you know, okay, let me just explain how I wrote it. I was in a class, and it was a class that was focused on writing dialogue, which is a really cool thing that I was able to study. <laughs> but, um, it was a really cool class, um, and at, at points we did like a lot of like writing in class. And I ended up writing a scene for Body Back, um, and I wrote this scene in class. But I wrote it as a screenplay, and I wrote it by hand. So <laughs> if you're a screenwriter and you're like, what the like, I wrote a screenplay by hand because I was, I, you know, my back said I am not lugging my four pound, pound laptop back and forth, like, if I don't have to. So I, I brought my notebook and I wrote this screenplay by hand. And I don't know if I can find the actual, like, original, original screenplay draft. And I don't feel like it would be interesting to talk about anyway. Um, but... I had had just the dialogue first. Now, I, I think this is a really cool technique that some people can use is writing out the dialogue first and then writing in the narrative. But I think this scene wasn't the right scene for that technique for me because it's a very emotional scene. <laughs> and like what I find happens, like, and I've done this before. I've tried writing dialogue first. Blah, 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 blah. I've writing for a long time. I've, writing, I've been writing for nearly 10 years, right? But, um... I've tried many different methods and what I find happens is because you just have dialogue and I'm sure screenwriters can relate to this in some ways, like the dialogue is what's propelling the plot, right? Like that is what is moving things forward. In a screenplay, you have dialogue and you have images. Um, in fiction, it's different because you have dialogue, you have images, and also you have like narrative. So you have an extra element there. And I found what happened with this excerpt is that it was so emotional that the dialogue that I needed to write, like in order to propel the plot, to propel me forward through the scene, was like, oh, like dialed up to 100. Like you can see elements of it in the final draft even. Like what's the line he says? Uh, par parade around as your son and then crash on the couch. Like that is like a real like, it's <laughs> a doozy of a line. Like that's quite intense, like something to say. And the reason it's there like here is because I had to keep some of the drama, like, but in, in revisions, I've revised this so many times. I had to really pull back because that original first draft was super dramatic, like that that screenplay. And again, I don't have the original screenplay. Well, I can tell you, it was so much more dramatic than this. And in some cases, like the drama is necessary for this scene. And I workshopped this this scene because um I ended up revising this for a portfolio for this this class, and um I turned it into I turned it back into fiction because it it had already you know I'd already wanted to put it back in body back right so I was able to turn it back into fiction and I workshopped this with a group of people who'd never never read my personal writing before like they read my my some of them had read my actual like short fiction but like not my personal writing so this was a really fun experience that was a little bit uncomfortable I'm usually not uncomfortable with people right reading my work but it was like so weird to hear people say Harrison's name um that I like kind of knew like that we were acquainted with but anyway so they somebody was super smart in that workshop and was basically explaining like well, yeah, like an element of drama is going to be needed here. And they had asked me, like, how old is he? And I was like, he's 21 here. Right. And um, I mean, like, so a, a level of drama, like being 21 and then being in Harrison's mindset, if you didn't catch the last episode, Harrison and his mother, who is Susanna. Oh, God, I should have said that much earlier. Well, hopefully all of you caught on to that. <laughs> Harrison's and his mother, Susanna, they don't have a great relationship at this point in the book because she abandoned him as a child, like when he was like seven, I think. And I was wrong in the last episode. She didn't see him again until he was 16, not 18. Um, but but still, like when she met back up with him when she was when he was 16, like it was not a good good thing. She was not there for him. She was struggling with her own issues and not focusing on him when he needed her. And so he is in this position where he's angry in this scene. In this bathroom scene, he doesn't want to talk to his mother because his mom is here to mother him, kind of. Like, I mean, he's 21 and she's aware of that. There's only so much she can do. But also she just wants to tell him, dude, you can't break into other people's houses and swim in their pool. And he's not even swimming. He's just floating there, fully clothed. <laughs> 
Harrison. Oh my God. Like that's her vibe right now. She's just like always a like a sigh, big sigh. And so she's trying to like mother him in a sense, but he doesn't want it because he's mad at her. And so the level of drama with the dialogue was kind of needed at points because yeah, like I'm not talking about the, you know, this particular dramatic dialogue. I want to talk about the Harry Sun line, but just to kind of talk about it for a second, some of the, some of the drama is needed. It's cringe. It's embarrassing. It's like, geez, like this is tough to read because it's embarrassing. But in a, in a way, like that is needed. You have to have that in this particular chapter in Body Back because he's just spent the whole first chapter acting like he's all that, like he's the shit. And this chapter is like really like cracking that. Like you're not actually the shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what the hell are you thinking? Um. Anyways, so um, I just thought that was it was interesting how I like I, I originally drafted it um as the screenplay. Then I put it back into fiction and then I edited the crap out of it. I edited it, I edited it, I edited it. And it was a lot of work. And a big point of contention for me was this, um, what is it? Harry's son, but I'm nobody's son line. I think that was the original. Yeah, he says in the first draft, and my name is kind of ironic, isn't it? Harry's son, he almost laughs, but I'm nobody's son. And I actually think in the original, original draft, it was, and my name is kind of idiotic. Isn't it, Harry Son? But I changed it to ironic. Yeah, the draft that I read wasn't even the first draft. This was like the third or fourth draft that I had read as the first draft. And then the other one was like the bajillionth draft, which if you didn't know about me and my writing process, I don't love doing a bunch of drafts. Not because I don't think drafts are useful. Just in my process, it is so much worse for me, I think, to like have to go in and like gut the crap out of something. Like I would rather kind of like not take my time because I, I used to take like a really long time writing. I'm still really quite fast at writing, but I like to have the pieces in place. I don't like to like, I don't know. I don't like to have to mess with it too much later. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just for this project. But uh, anyways, I'm going to take a Chardonnay break. But basically, <laughs> basically, I had posted a writing update for this chapter on Tumblr, which, you know, if you want self-respect for me, you know, maybe don't follow me on there. <laughs> the people who follow me on Tumblr, they're realists. Thank you so much. Anyways, but my main point of contention when I was thinking about this, you know, chapter and sort of this, what I'm going to put out in the update was like, do I want to keep the Harry Sun line? Because when I post updates on Tumblr, I often revise like the, the pieces, just a like line editor or whatever, so that I don't embarrass myself on the in internet forever. And uh, one of my wonders was, should I delete this Harry Sun line? Because I remember writing it. This was actually in the original handwritten screenplay, the Harry Sun line. I had written it down and I remember thinking to myself, writing it in red pen, literally on my notebook at like three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, this is so stupid as I was writing it. But like, it was a writing sprint that I guess we were doing in class. So I was just like, whatever, I just need to write something. I need to write something. I don't want to overthink this too much. So I just wrote it out, even though in my mind, I was like, this is dumb as hell. <laughs> like, Harry's son, I'm nobody's son. And I've known about the name of Harrison, like, or the meaning of Harrison's name for a really long time, because it's like very obvious. <laughs> right? So it's just something that had come to me while I was drafting. But I, I knew it, it sounded kind of silly to me, but I still wrote it. And, and it somehow managed to stay through me turning it back into prose. The line still stayed because there was something about it. I was like, Something about this Harry son of nobody's son is just very interesting to me because he's saying it out loud. And I don't know. I think that it was revealing to him. There's something revealing about that line. And I think I talked about that in the writing update where I was on the fence of whether or not I should delete it. And the reason I thought I should delete it is because I thought it was too much. I thought it was too on the nose. I thought it was unbelievable. I thought it was a little ridiculous, but I also know Harrison, right? I know Harrison better than anybody ever knows Harrison, obviously, because he's in my head. He's my baby. <laughs> and so I know him very, very well. I've been writing for him with him with him for, for so long. And I was like, okay, if I know this character so much, then how come like I want to hang on to this line so bad? Because usually like I can tell if something's not in Harrison's character or if I need to revise something because something's just not right. With all of my characters, like the core characters from Fostered, which is a series of which this this novella comes from if you're new here. But um all the characters I know very well. So I was like, okay. Rachel, if this line is sticking out to you as something like 
he would say, then he would probably say it. And I, I started to think, like, why would he say, because the original line is, my name is kind of ironic, isn't it? Harry's son, but I'm nobody's son. Why would he say that? You know, like, especially Harry's son, I'm nobody's son. Interesting. Like, why would he say it? I don't know. What had come, what had stuck out to me was that, but I'm nobody's son. Like, to say that out loud when you're standing in front of your mom and he's had this whole internal monologue, which I didn't read about fathers and how his dad's not here, blah, blah, blah. And then he's talking about God as a father. And then obviously he's talking about his mother, Susanna, who's the center of this chapter. This chapter is called Immaculate Mary because it's about Mary and Jesus as much as it is about Susanna and Harrison. In this moment, he's thinking so much about parental figures and then the thing that he says, not a, just thinks, it's not just in the internal narrative because he has a very active internal voice. What he actually says is, I'm nobody's son. So to like look at yourself, he's staring at himself in the mirror also as a context. To look at yourself and then to look at your mother, to think about your father, to think about God as a father, to think about sons, to think of Jesus as a son, as the son of, as Joseph, of this, as the son of God, as the son of Mary. And then to say out loud, I'm nobody's son, like, oh, like something about it was hitting for me. Like it was sad. It was a self-aware line. Like after an entire chapter, which is the first chapter was called um, Living Pictures, which is about basically fakeness, to, to have a genuine line of like, I'm nobody's son. It felt like such a reversal from the fakery of that first chapter. Like he's actually saying something that he's thinking. Um, but it was a it was a point of contention. And when I talked about it to the workshop, the workshop was like, no, I like I feel like it's fine. Like it's it is kind of cringe. Like, <laughs> Thank you to the person. It was actually so, so helpful. They had said, you know, it is kind of cringe, but like like it's kind of supposed to be right. And it's true. It is it is cringe and it is supposed to be. The whole book is cringe and it's supposed to be. Um, however, I sent this to my prof. 22 minutes in and I'm talking about the actual process of how we got to the line that I'm actually going to talk about. <laughs> but I showed this to my prop and I, I had asked during my office hours, hey, you know what? Like, what do you think about that line? Do you think it's too much? Because it's it's been a concern of mine. At that point, I had been revising this thing for maybe a, like – three weeks or something because I'd been working on it for this portfolio and then working on it in body back and even after I published the writing update I wasn't happy with the scene because it was just it wasn't giving cringe in the right way <laughs> um and so uh I asked them about this and my prof said like it doesn't seem believable like it seems unbelievable and a part of me was like damn like when I was listening to them talk to me I was like hmm you know, like I really, <laughs> there's something about that line that I just want to keep. I didn't want to, so they were just like, you know, cut it, like basically remove it because, you know, it's not really believable that he would, and they were talking about the Harry son part, that he would say his, the name of like the meaning of his name. It's not believable that somebody would do that. And at, at points I could kind of argue in my head, like, like, and for the portfolio, it didn't make sense to keep it because th there was no context. But for the entirety of Body Back, I was trying to think to myself, like, okay, when I eventually put this back in my book, like, do I want to keep it? And I was thinking, you know, like, Harrison, though, like, he, Harrison knows a lot of stuff he shouldn't know in Body Back. And this is kind of where we get to, like, things that you like in the original draft that aren't in the final draft, for example. Harrison is an atheist and he didn't grow up religious. He knows nothing about religion, but the entirety of Body Back, he's trying to get over his ex, whose name is Lonan, who was an ex-Catholic. So Lonan knows a lot about God and Harrison therefore knows that God is important to Lonan despite Lonan no longer being a believer, or so he says. And so um, Harrison knows a lot though about the Bible, like to the point where logically, I would sit down and be like, all right, so this is a novella for this novel I wrote called Mothwork. Clearly, Harrison, sometime, sometime between the, the ending of Mothwork and the beginning of Body Back, which is about a month, in that time, he got a Bible and he studied the crap out of the Bible. Like, because there's no possible way he could make all of these religious illusions without knowing that. And uh, some people might be like, well, that's just Rachel, like, injecting her religious, you know, Catholic isms into the writing, which part of it is, but I think it's also fun to think, oh yeah, no, like he definitely went to a church or he went to a store or whatever. Like he like he bought a Bible and he's been studying the hell out of the Bible. So I could believe in some sense that he would know that the meaning of his name and he would say it out loud almost because 
like I mean for Harrison Har- Harrison the n- name means Harry's son just like very easy to remember but at the same time like you know, what he actually is what my my prof was asking me but I could kind of rationalize when I, when I put it back in body back you know would it still work for the portfolio it wouldn't work but for body back so I was thinking about it and uh I wasn't sure I was still on the fence I I I liked the line because but I'm nobody's son. Harry's son, but I'm nobody's son. Like, there's something like that rings there. I don't know what, but it's just so good. Um, and my prof actually told me, but I really liked the but I'm nobody's son bit. So I had said, originally when I left that office hours, I was like, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have him say say something in narrative that triggers him to then say, but I'm nobody's son. And that was my plan. And then I actually went to revise. And this is how it went. And we will talk about it when Rachel drinks more Chardonnay. I sat down to revise this. And I had had this very clear plan. I was like, great. I'm going to go in. I'm going to have him think something in his head like, oh, God, like, it sucks to not have a parent. And then have him say but I'm nobody's son, you know, but in like a literary way. And um, th- it didn't happen that way. I was sitting there and I was like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to keep Harry's son in narrative and then put, but I'm nobody's son in dialogue. It kind of needed to be either everything was in dialogue, like how the original draft was Harry's son, but I'm nobody's son, or it needed to be uh, all in narrative, which is how I ended up actually revising it. So the revised line is, in elementary school, he learned the meaning of his name for a history project, Harry's son. It all seems so ironic now. He's nobody's son. So that's the line as it is now. And a part of me is sad because I liked having him say it. I loved actually having him say Harry's son, but I'm nobody's son out loud. And I think in a way I could go back and I could change it back. And it's not, you know, my prof said this, so I did it. No, <laughs> I actually, I agreed with the feedback because it was something that had bothered me. And I actually liked the revised version a lot. Like the line is great. Like to, to see like a, a mini flashback, like him learning the meaning of his name in elementary school. And then Harry's son, it all seems so ironic. Now he's nobody's son. And, 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 uh, I, I think that's quite neat, but there was something psychologically and it could be just because he's my character and I just know him very well. Like that to me was just so painful about him saying it out loud, which I think is so interesting in revision, how you can like things that you take away, you know, like we've all heard the term kill your darlings. And I think in one of this, you know, in this case, this was a darling, but in like a deeply emotional way. Now, Body Back is an extremely personal project to me. It's, I have described it, <laughs> unfortunately, as as much about me as it is about Harrison. And to to see like this like vulnerable moment where he's like, I'm nobody's son. I have no parent. I'm alone. Oh, I was like, baby, somebody needs to hug you. You need to kiss on the forehead. And it pained me to take it away because I wanted to see him in that moment where he was self-aware because I know Harrison and he doesn't get that way, not in body back. So to hear him get that way in the original draft really hit different. But on the other hand, in the second draft, I I don't think it's as overt, the line. And I think, you know, there's something, I don't know, about the rhythm of that second paragraph that works better. Like, he's the only one here in front of his mother, a son, yeah, but who's? In elementary school, he learned the meaning of his name for a history project, Harry's son. It all seems so ironic now. He's nobody's son. Like, there's still that element of sadness and loneliness. I think how it says, Harry's son, but I'm nobody's son, almost sounds like when he's saying it, like dialogue, sounds more desperate. And then I think in narrative, it sounds more quieter and more painful. So <laughs> it's so interesting how you can revise something and like both for different reasons, how revision is a linear process and revision can also be something that changes. You don't have to you know, call it one and done forever. Oh, I revised it. I never have to go back. No, keep your drafts because you can go back. And I have all the drafts, so not to worry about that. If I do want to go back to the original where it says, you know, Harry's son, I'm nobody's son. Um, What I did lose out on because I I turned it into internal narrative, I I lose out. I lost out on Susanna telling him, but you're my son, Um, which, which I really quite liked that line. 
but also I thought maybe it would work better like on the screen or something because I just think it it just was calling too much attention on the page. I don't know. What do you guys think? I'd be really interested if you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment. Let me know what you think about it um, because this, this line, I don't know. It just means a lot to me. Like uh, funnily to the point where I think the final chapter in this book is going to be called Harry's son. And that's actually what I did for this. When I submitted it as my portfolio, we were supposed to title each excerpt and I titled the excerpt as Harry's son. So I was still able to have Harry's son kind of at the center of it. But it's, it's interesting to me because <laughs> the line is funny in a sense, because he's not Harry's son. His father's name isn't Harry. He doesn't even know his father's name. He doesn't know his father. He doesn't remember his father. All he remembers about his dad are the bad things. And um, it's it's funny to me because in a way, calling himself Harry's son is, say, is saying simultaneously that he is nobody's son because Harry doesn't exist, um, which is just so interesting to me. I don't know. The, the line is cool. I think it's it's profound in a really Harrison way. Like, oh, like of course, he would say something like that. And um, so maybe in a couple of years, I'll look back on this and I'll have a more definitive answer of what I want because I have a very clear vision for body back. And this is the one time I think so far that I've been drafting where I couldn't tell what to do. Like usually I'm like quite like, okay, I know exactly what I need to do here. But yeah, this line I had wanted to evoke something, but I wasn't sure if it was the desperation like in the original draft or if it was that quiet pain like in the final draft, I ended up landing on quiet pain, but I don't know. It doesn't have to stay that way or he can say it again later. In I think now that it's a narrative in this chapter, my brain could be setting me up to have him say it out loud later and then it would make more sense for him to say it out loud later. I'm going to write that down as a note as I have ideated that idea, though I think somebody told me that. I can't remember. If you did tell me that, thank you. Um, just putting it later in the book, having him say it instead of having him say it now. So if Harry's son of nobody's son turns into dialogue, uh, y'all will be the first to know. <laughs> Cause uh, it, yeah, it's currently now back into narrative. I just think it's cool. Also a bit of a real silly Easter egg. I, I just love the placement of nobody. I am a Grace and Chance girly. I love Grace and Chance so much. And his song, Nobody, is the sad version, the 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 Vivo live performance one that you can watch on YouTube. That one is Harrison as as in, in the whole book. And I love that we got a bit of a nobody mention. It has nothing to do with <laughs> sonhood, that song. But it it does it's obvious it's called nobody. So I thought it was cool. Cause I think the whole book, Harrison does feel like a nobody, which is why in the next chapter, you know, this chapter was Immaculate Mary, the next chapter 24 Karat Harrison, which, you know, you can read the writing update on my blog. Um, he does turn into somebody. He turns into 24 Karat Harrison. He's tired of being nobody. And I, I just think he's he's such a profound little guy. I just want to, I don't know, collect him and hold him in my hand forever. I, I feel like, I don't know, I feel very attached to him as a person. And I've always felt very attached to Harrison as a person. Ever since I wrote him when I was 13 at like 8.38 p.m. on October 2nd, <laughs> when I wrote the first thing I ever did with Harrison I, I knew I would be <laughs> in in it forever with this man. And I think there's something quite lovely about being able to experience the nuances of his experience, even if it's like in revision. If it's me wondering if I did the right thing for his psychology in revision, if it's me wondering, you know, you know, will he say this again in, in the later chapter? What did it actually mean for him to admit that out loud? Versus what does it mean for him to admit it in narrative? And is one better than the other is a really interesting question. But this episode is 35, 35 minutes long. I was going to say 25 minutes long. 35 minutes long. So we are going to close off on the Harry's Son episode. How revision can be a complicated thing. To whoever listens to this. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the second installment. I am hoping that we could talk about somebody that isn't Harrison in the next episode, but I, I just, he's so, I just want to pry him apart like the operation guy, you know? Like, 
he's just a really good character. Like, holy crap, I will never write a character as good as this. Okay, all right. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening uh, to this episode of After Draft, where we talk about all the things that I did after the draft, et cetera, et cetera. I will see you or, I don't know, talk to you. I have no idea how to close these off in a not YouTuber way. See y'all in the next one. <laughs> no, I will, I don't know, catch you later. Okay, bye. <laughs>